Hi, I'm Austin Wintry, and this is the Game Maker's Notebook. This time, uh, a kind of novel and an unusual turn of events for this show. I had a lovely chat with Stephanie Ekonomu, the composer of the two recent DLCs for AC Valhalla, The Siege of Paris, and Dawn of Ragnarok. It was particularly interesting because this was her first ever entry point to the world of games, having come exclusively from TV and film prior to that. And it seemed like an absolute priority to unpack her experiences on scoring a game for the first time and to really dig into the details because, to cap it all off, she was the winner of the first ever Grammy for video game music specifically for uh, Dawn of Ragnarok. And so in addition to just being an awesome person and a really talented composer and delight to talk to, uh, a very valuable person to step through what it's like to score one's first game and then have it succeed at the highest level. So... I hope you'll enjoy it. I certainly did. Our noble realm has been torn asunder. By invaders of frost and flame. Everybody dies. Surprise, surprise. We tell each other lies. All father, they have your son. And so does ours. We might not be alone. Oh, shapeshifter. Everybody dies. Destroy That's what they say. Deceiver. Hello, Steph. How are you? Hello, Austin. I am well. And yourself? I'm doing excellent. Um, we are one week and change from your illustrious history bifurcating uh, Grammy win. The world, the world will never be the same. It is, it is no less of a differentiation of the timeline as the, you know, BC, AD uh, calendar year separation, I suspect. How are you feeling on the heels of your uh, magnificent achievement? I feel I feel great. I feel still slightly in shock. Um, and I think this is the peak and it's only downhill from here, truly. So that's a, that's a fun moment to have reached in my life. Good to be catching you right at the precipice of the of the cliff's edge. Then yes, and 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 at the beginning of my video game career as well. So just peak early and then just peter out into nothingness. That's my that's my life motto. Excellent. Yes, the uh, the uh, Richard Crafts uh, one of his favorite games of like n name that forgotten Oscar winner. Um, uh, <laughs> but I suspect that will not be the case. I have strong feelings that. Um, this is indeed a starting salvo and not uh, and not a peak. Nonetheless, I was excited to get into this because um, this is highly, highly novel. The idea of sort of stepping up at bat and going, I should try this, and then just so utterly decimating 
uh, <laughs> the uh, you know the the situation in the best in the best sense. Um, it's pretty awesome. So just for the, I, I don't like to be very clinical about this, but why don't you just give me the quick rundown on your path into being a composer period. You know, I want to, I want to really kind of get into that first game score experience, but let's earn, let's earn the right to that story first. So, oh, yes. uh, so yeah, you know, what, what age I know for a fact that your father is as about, well, I may in fact be a musician, uh, but he's certainly not professionally uh, something that is <laughs> typical of our line of work. Uh, how did you wind your way to where you are? Just step me through it. Yeah, so I'm from New York originally. Um, grew up with a very New York family. My dad, who you alluded mean in the to, city? Um, was born in Queens, but grew up on Long Island. Um, but most mm. of our families, you know, in Queens. Uh, so, you know, the proximity to New York City was, I think, a big um, influential thing in my life, being that close to uh, so much massive, you know, cultural diversity in the arts. Um, so, you know, growing up, going to going to the Met and going to the Blue Note and um, Carnegie Hall and all that stuff, I definitely think that certainly fostered and nurtured my love of music. Um, but yes, my dad is a retired undercover for the NYPD. Um, and my mom is a CPA. And my dad played drums growing up, but my mom is tone deaf, uh, God bless her soul. Uh, she'll still sing Barbara Streisand at the top of her lungs, which we love her for. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I grew up um, with my older sister who played viola and she taught me like how to hold the bow and stuff and taught me how to screech out these obscene sounds on the instrument and At when what I age? that was probably I was probably six when she started playing viola and then the following year I picked up the violin in school so we started you know playing duets together when both of us had some level of uh proficiency on the instrument and minimal so I think screeching. that minimal screeching at that stage yeah I think we 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 got there eventually but what do you know what the catalyst was for her because again if if you have Tone deaf CPA and narc you didn't specify <laughs> narcotics undercover. Forgive me if yes. I'm speaking mm -hmm. out of turn, but I just found that so compelling and fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the like, was it just the school said you have to pick an instrument or something, or how do you how does one know to reach for that in a household like that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly, my sister wanted to play the bass, the upright bass, and my parents said, that's way too fucking big. We're not doing that. And then so she settled on the viola. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so there's that, uh, which is, yeah, not not the typical choice for we skipped for a, a pretty powerful step in between viola yeah, and bass, didn't though. Land you on think the cello. She yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, right. she, did she pursue music at all, or is she off doing something totally, totally different? She is a doctor now. She's an OBGYN um, and yeah, a women's health advocate. And but she but she played viola all through college, um, so it was still a big part of her life. And then at some stage, she was doing her residency in Los Angeles, and I was like, "Hey, can I borrow your viola to record on this score?" And she said, "Yeah, sure." And then she never got it back because it's hanging on the wall back there. <laughs> you've never uh, spoken. It's actually a very sore point again. in the family. never spoken yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she'll probably want that back at some point, but it's on, it's been on all of the scores that I've, I've done really. So I think that's a nice little tribute to like us and the music that we used to make though. Someday she's just going to show up here and take it and then that'll be it. Yeah. Well, it'll be a dark day. Uh, this now, this now legendary viola. That's yes. fascinating though. I really, I really, uh, yeah, it's always people that come from very naturally musical households are kind of, I think like the composer cliche. Um, but it seems like it, at least 50% of the time, it's a story more like yours because it's very similar to mine. My father was an orthopedic surgeon and my mom, mm. you know, like my mom was at home, but she was also kind of a freelance artist. And at one point she also ran a dance studio Hmm. Um, uh, like for kids, you know, like learn, like kids, you know, it was the eighties, it was like learning, you know, dance choreography to Madonna and Michael Jackson <laughs> and stuff. But, um, but point, so, which is, I guess, music adjacent, but, but, uh, but yeah, neither at all were musicians in any, uh, capacity or, or growing up. So I was kind of the, the anomaly. They were like, well, we should probably just let him 
find his way because we have no experience in this, which is sure. honestly, I think why he became a composer because very quickly it was like, oh, writing music is way cooler than practicing piano. I, I, I would much rather do that. And it sounds kind of like you had your own version of something along those lines. Um, yeah, I, I think I was lucky that we went to like the public schools on Long Island are generally very good in the arts. So I, I think it was, you know, from a young age that was fostered in a lot of the education systems and there. And, you know, in high school, we had like a four year music theory and composition intensive program, which is like unheard of at a public school. Four years? That's yeah, all so of high school. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, wow. not everybody did it for all four years, but it, that's when I really started writing music. And, um, you know, I had a great teacher. He, he was like the keyboard player for Meatloaf back in the day. And he just was the coolest dude and taught us music theory. And he was just fantastic. But yeah, I think I think the music program, definitely, I was just encouraged to ha develop this love for orchestral music, even from a young age. But what about like, did you play an instrument in school or you just took up piano? And that was kind of the your experience. With I was definitely the, yeah, no, I was definitely the, the composer pianist, you know, mm. sort of B minus pianist. I very quickly learned to write music beyond what I could play personally um, and enlisted the more serious actual pianist. But I was lucky because when I was a teenager, um, you know, I started, I became this obsessive soundtrack nerd thanks to my piano teacher at about age 10 and started going to record stores and buying used soundtracks and things, you know, it's like all my allowance of things was, was poured into this. And so even by the time of high school, I had hundreds and hundreds of them. And I noticed that of the composers who I really admired the most, which tended to be on the more tr sort of old school uh, end of the spectrum, the Williams, the Horners, the Goldsmith above all, um, I was very intrigued by the whole composed and conducted by. So when I was 14 and I went into high school, I, I kind of went stampeding into the orchestra and, and said, you know, I'd like to conduct, give me the orchestra, please. And uh, <laughs> the teacher was a guy named Dan Levitt to his credit. He was like, sure. And I basically had a private orchestra for four years uh, where I could write music and learn by just standing in front of them and fucking up horribly and then trying again, you know, a week later or whatever. And by the time I went to college and had my first actual orchestration class, I had probably spent a thousand hours with a real orchestra. And so it was like, you just learn, oh. you learn from these amazing mistakes. Like I'll never forget, this is so burned into me, but the best, one of the best experiences of humiliation I ever had in my life was uh, writing for the brass the first time when I was like 14, you know, cause I started with the string orchestra. And it was like, okay, got my, you know, you know, an alto clef. What the fuck? You know, like that, you, you go through those hurdles. And then, uh, but then it was like, okay, let's add in, you know, the brass, the percussion, blah, blah, blah. And because they had different orchestras, you know, the school was a huge public school, 4,000 students. So they had like five orchestras. And so once I was working with the real full, like 70 people, I will never forget, I start conducting this piece and the trumpets all were wrong but oddly consistently wrong. Uh, <laughs> and that was the day I learned about transposition. transposition and, yeah. and they very generously were like, bro, did you, did you put this off a step? And I was kind of like, what exactly do you mean? It was, it was a very humbling moment. And, but that's what I loved is all of my education for those years was that way. It was bumping yeah. into a wall and then scratching it out, trying it again, you know, a week or two later and just, incalculable education. So yeah, stupidly lucky uh, to, to have insane. something like that. I've never heard anything like that. I mean, but it's so true. I mean, we there's no way that we learn as composers how to do these things like in a classroom. You need to actively be collaborating with musicians and making those fuck ups and learning from them. And, you know, 100%. I find that musicians are just so great about providing that education. Like it's, it's really just such a great opportunity. I'm, I'm very jealous. I wish I had the balls to just go into my orchestra and be like, I, I'm the conductor <laughs> now. I'm the captain now. But we did, we did similarly because of that composition program I was telling you about, you know, I started, we had like a composition concert at the end of every year. And, um, oh, wow. you know, I started like, I started with like a piano trio and then was like moving up to the string orchestra. And then my senior year, I did, I wrote like a symphony, um, like a tone poem kind of thing. And no I'm shit. just remembering 
I'm just, it was not good, but I'm just remembering now that well, I, my earth. I mean, yeah, everything I was, that's baked into the, like, just assume that about everything I was just talking about as well, by the way, it's, <laughs> it's, it's piles of garbage, but it's educational Gosh. garbage. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm remembering vividly now that when it came time to name my compositions, I came up with the stupidest titles and they sounded so lame in English that I would just put them all in Italian because I thought that was a better <laughs> idea truth be told it was, classic, wor- like it was worse yeah yeah it is such a that's such a like student tell um you know like <laughs> completely you know con- concierto in f in soul uh yeah it's yeah uh, it's the best i love those Horrifying. little harmal har- like of who we were yeah i'll see those every now and mm-hmm. again and i'll just think oh my god i'm so it's like facebook memories from 14 years ago and you're like i was such an idiot what was i oh, i can't believe i thought worst. fit to share these things publicly like, cause they're, it's not even that they're embarrassing. It's they're so dumb. They're so just absent any substance or point or value to the world. Yeah. It's um, painfully dumb. I was such a douche. I, I try not to look at those Facebook memories. It's too painful. Yeah. Yeah. It should, we should have a thing that auto, auto, uh, kind of deletes, like just like everything past a certain age sunsets out of existence, yes. but yes, I kind of feel that way about my music as well. It's like once it reaches Same. 10 years, once there's like a certain half life. That you go now, it's too old to 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 look at anymore, and and all yeah. that early stuff, yeah. So, uh, well, that that is really that's really cool that you. Uh, I, that's actually very comparable. I mean, it's funny you said I never heard of that, and then you describe something that's pretty similar, actually, of just grabbing those friends and musicians around you and being like, let's just make stuff. Uh, so the thing I'm curious about is you were in tandem with this sort of discovering games, I gather, given that you told yes. me Halo, Counter-Strike, et cetera, were, were kind of part of your, you know, earliest gaming experience. Like where, do you have, do you have specific memory? I can't remember if I asked you this the other day or not. On um, like a game coming across your desk, so to speak, and being like, holy shit, this is something else. This is different. This is not, I don't lump this in with movies now, like, or whatever. This is really its own thing. Yeah, I mean, I like my earliest memories of childhood. I was playing Sega Genesis with my sister, um, so we like played all those Which Disney games? games, like The Aladdin, The Lion King. We played Toe Jam and Earl which is still one of my favorites. And my husband like got the legacy one to play on PS5. Um, awesome. It was PS5 or maybe it was the Switch actually. Um, yeah, like Sonic and Earthworm Jim and like all of those uh, like classic Genesis games. And then we got an Xbox at like some, one of the first ones, one of the first generation Xbox, whenever that came out. And that's Around when I started 2000, like- 99, 2000, I think was, yeah, the, so I was the very first Xbox. Yeah, I remember it being then, and that's when I like played Halo, and um, Max Payne was a big one. Counter-Strike, obviously, I played on Steam on PC. Um, but that was, Halo was a big, big one. I mean, probably because I never had anything in between a Sega Genesis and, a, and an Xbox, but it was, a, it was a big leap just as far as like cinematic storytelling. Like I watched and, Gone with the Wind and then Jurassic Park. Exactly, yes. That, that was essentially my gaming experience. Um, but yeah, Halo Halo left a, a pretty indelible mark on, on me, I would say. Um, so did Max Payne. And I think I told you the other day I was um, I was like sick in December with COVID and I, I was playing it again, the original Max Payne. And I was like, oh, this is janky as hell, but I still love it so much. Um, that game so, was yeah, really I, powerful. I, I, I remember the first time, the way that that game kind of like gamifies the, his trauma And the way you kind of go into these sort of horrified flashbacks that are very surreal and nightmare-like. And I haven't really played a game, Never mind the cool bullet time stuff. That was cool. But the, uh, but the, 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 the sort of surreal embrace of a psychological concept was really, I remember it it making a huge impression that it it, like playing through that and not just relegating it to a cutscene or text or something like they are a jaded blah, 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 but like, Stepping through was huge. It was really quite, yeah, that's a hell of a game. It really is. I, I, the, the thing that stands out the most to me from that game is that awesome bullet, like the slow-mo stuff. And also the, yeah, like the nightmare sequences that you walk through with this like horrifying 
retelling of all of his trauma and that that shit stuck with me i mean that was not like any other i mean you could put that in a movie and it wouldn't have been the same experience because you're like terrified to walk through these dark halls of his mind and his memory and yeah i i that game is is so fantastic and just like the noir slash comic book aspect of it too i think is really awesome and unique so you know yeah i think this this is just games have been in me for a long time and i sort of lost um when I went off to college, I wasn't really playing them anymore because I didn't have a way of playing it. The Xbox was relegated to the what we called club basement in my in my house on Long Island. Um, so I I kind of like club lost basement? touch with it. What is that? What, what what does that mean? That feels like a <laughs> so, story. My um, this is very common in like probably a lot of East Coast homes, but my parents like redid the basement of our house and just made it like this awesome space for all of us. We had like a pool table and an air hockey table and a bar, which I totally didn't drink at when I was under 21. Um, and uh, yeah, like, unfa- I know just. Um, well, meanwhile, your <laughs> narcotics hunting father is across town like I'll show these ne'er do wells. Yeah, taking us uh, back to Prohibition era, one 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 baddie at a time. I don't even know yeah, what my they dad could be. More the opposite. So you want some tequila? Have some tequila. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then we had the games down there. We had like DDR, and we would play. You know, it was just a good time, and it was a good hang for all of our friends and family when they all came over. So we call that club basement. Um, but yeah, I, I left home, and the games stayed in club basement, and it wasn't until probably a few years ago, really, that I started playing again. And I think that's because my husband is a big gamer. And so we we play a lot of co-op mm. games together. And, um, you know, if there's games that I just don't have the like time to sink the hours in, I'll just like be there watching it and doing other things while he's playing it. Like Elden Ring, I never would be able to tackle. But, um, you know, we takes did a special it takes kind of two. Person. Is a special kind of person. Yeah, it takes two we did together, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, Unravel, A Way Out, and yeah, some other stuff that I've. So you're just a Joseph own. Ferris fan, I gather. Then uh... big fan, big fan. Um, and yeah, like I've, I'm in the middle of The Last of Us and Stray, and started getting into some of the Annapurna stuff, which is amazing. Which I know you know a thing or two about. I I have I have done some dancing with Annapurna. <laughs> um, yeah, so that so that all kind of beautifully hands off to what I was wondering then, which was where, well, actually two part question. Did your interest in music and composing as this thing in high school immediately lead to, oh, I actually want to do that for a living? Like, cause some kids compose and then, you know, maybe here and there write something on the side of whatever their life becomes because it's a creative outlet for them, but never actually pursue it or even take it seriously. At some point, you obviously did take it seriously. So what was the catalyst to that? And was it primarily film? Or did you ever have games, knowing that you're playing games in the midst of all that, you have a positive association with games. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming, you know, like if you're falling, you know, very few people fall in love with Halo without simultaneously falling in love with Marty O'Donnell, for example. Like, I imagine this was all kind of on your radar. So when did it become a thing where you go, actually, like, why can't I do that? Yeah, you would think it would be a really organic thing like that, but I guess my prefrontal cortex was not developed enough yet to just like make that connection. I mean, I loved all of these games and film and TV and those soundtracks and stuff, but I was mainly focused on concert composition, probably because of the environment I grew up in, like very classical, sort of motivated. Very East Coast, and yeah. Yeah. So, um, and when I was like certain, and who were the out know, of curiosity then? Who were your heroes then? Like, who were you going? Like, who who's well, I, that's that says it enough. Who were your heroes, concert music wise? Just out of curiosity. Um, I loved Bartok. I loved Mozart, Beethoven. What a win! Bonner. What a perfect answer. Bartok, yeah, the greatest Bart- ever. Yep, yep. That's that was he. He's he's one of my favorites for sure. Um, but I when I was deciding where to go to school, I was still torn whether or not I wanted to actually 
go hard in the music direction because I was really highly academic in school. So I was like, do I want to specialize and go to a conservatory or is that limiting myself? I was still totally unsure if I wanted to like really give it a go in music professionally. And my dad was the one that convinced me you should go to a conservatory because that'll be you'll you'll find out so quickly if this is something that you want to do because it's so balls to the wall. And that was great advice. Um, I still sort of was yearning for a more like liberal arts, well-rounded education, but I ended up scoring my first short film while I was at Music Conservatory. And then it just like clicked immediately from there. So I never had the opportunity to do it or I never sought it out to like score to picture before then. I took like one mm. film scoring class in school, but that was like it. We only had the one semester and it was a graduate course. And I took that my freshman year, <laughs> first semester. Uh, and then I had some, yeah, some, some buddies I went to high school with who were at Emerson and they said, we have these short films. Do you want to try scoring them? And the second I did my first one, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And it just clicked immediately. And so then what about the games component of it? Did you ever, like prior to crossing paths with, U with Ubisoft and be and coming on board with, you know, the Valhalla DLCs. Um, was it a thing that you were actively kind of on the hunt for or seeking out or like, you know, in conversations with the agency going, this is a thing I'd really like to have on the menu, you know, like at what mm -hmm. point was it really kind of a pursuit conscientiously? I never specifically said I really want to make my focus games, but I always said to my agent, I want to do film, TV and games. I don't want to like pursue one harder than the other, um, but I'm like open if there's anyone. I mean, I was very aware that I was super green and like, how do you, it's the that old conundrum of how do you get a gig if you have no experience kind of thing. And I truly had no experience in games apart from being a score recordist on advanced Call of Duty Advanced Warfare with Harry Gertz and Williams. So I was like, I had really no experience. So I was like, if somebody wants to hire a, a composer who's mainly just been doing film and TV for a game, like I'm super down. And Ubisoft came along and they were like, do you want a demo for this DLC called The Siege of Paris, um, which is under the Valhalla umbrella? And I was like, oh, this feels awesome. Yes, of course, I would love to do it. And that was that was really the start. So the timing of it, I don't, it was, it was just like anything else. I can't say that anything led to it in particular, other than Ubisoft taking a particular initiative to want to hire younger talent and newer voices in the DLC space, which I really commend them for. I think it's awesome that they did that. Sounds like you basically just go through life with no plan, just chaotically moving like a, a ball in a, in a pinball machine. Just yes, that's me, em totally. Em embracing ricocheting off objects and hurling towards other ones and going, yeah, you know what? Now this, let's do yeah, that. Fine. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, that's how I live my life. It's not all delicately planned and neurotically looked over, over and over with tons of anxiety. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 that's, that's actually probably quite a bit of wisdom as well, because, you know, basically every time, especially in this field, and especially as a freelancer, all plans will eventually, like the maximum plan I find that I can make is what do I want to have for lunch today? And that's a 50-50 shot of actually coming to fruition. So totally. it, you know, once you start onto a time horizon of a week, a month, a year, 10 year, uh, it's, it's pretty it's pretty hard to do anything remotely reliable. So I think, uh, I think just not even trying is a sign of wisdom. Oh, well, yeah, least, it, it, things, things will hopefully come. And then I think the constant is always just putting your head down, doing the work and, you know, you have to see what happens. You can't predict it, but you got to just like be consistent with what kind of collaborator you are and pound the pavement mm -hmm. and find new people and network and all that stuff. Obviously those are the constants, but otherwise there's very little control. I've found at least. So out of curiosity, because you reminded me that your time, I had it in my mind that your span with uh, Mr. Gregson Williams was post the last time he worked in games because it's he he did some stuff, you know, a fair bit before your time with him. But I, in my mind, yeah. the last one would have been before. So it's actually interesting. I'm just curious what your impression uh, if from your vantage point in the capacity that you were part of the team, there was any real noteworthy difference between scoring a film or a game or if from, from the angle that you were in, it was still fundamentally a similar production process? Um, it was definitely similar 
but mainly because I came on so late to that project when I was hired with Harry that he was just finishing up cutscenes. So like everything else had been done at that point. I so he was so. very much just like traditionally scoring. So I didn't really get to see, get like good insight into what that process was. So when Ubisoft hired me, I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You guys got to like, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions and I'm sorry if it gets annoying, but like, this is very new to me, um, the whole process. That's a perfect were, segue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you like, like, okay, let's, let's now really get into that because you've got, you've got a lot of experience in film and TV and, and, pro and undoubtedly are very at home with the, the general processes yeah. of those. And so games are fascinating because on some days it's like, I just have to write good music. And then on other yeah. days, they're so different from each other that it's almost no, it's like, it's, 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 it's almost like one's music and one isn't. I mean, it's just, they're, they're so far apart and mm -hmm. depending on which day you land on, um, it could really be either of those, at least in my yeah. um, experience. And so, um, so yeah, I, my whole agenda, if I have one beyond just hanging out and hoping it's interesting for anybody who listens is, uh, really unpacking what that learning curve was like for you and where you, cause I, I, I'll, not, I'll admit, I can't, I get a little bored when I'm asked for the 10,000th time to describe the difference between scoring a game and yeah, scoring a film. <laughs> it's like, everybody thinks they're the first person to ever ask you that. I and know. It's become an interesting litmus test of my mood. Cause sometimes I'm like, oh, so it's really interesting. And other times I'm like, whatever, man, you know, it's, a, so yeah, in any case, but I, I am putting that horribly cliche question to you because the lens of working on one's first game, I just haven't ever had anybody on this podcast to really walk me mm -hmm. through that first game's experience, recognizing that that Dawn of Ragnarok, for which you illustriously won the Grammy, is in fact your second time at bat. So we are really, second. I guess, talking about Siege of Paris. Uh, but just wa walk me through that learning experience. Was it exciting? Did you find yourself you know, nervous. Did you, in fact, annoy them with your incessant questions? Tell, tell, tell me all of it. Let's ruin um, your career was, right here. Oh yeah. Oh, I think we're yeah. We're with all the interviews that I've done in the past week. I've certainly said something to ruin my career at least once or twice. Um, but Excellent. I, yeah, I would say I was really terrified. I was especially terrified coming into the world of Valhalla because. Sarah and Jesper and Anar have created this like amazing legacy for the sound of that game. And I was like, Jesus Christ, how am I going to, even if they were encouraging me, like you don't need to do the sound of the score, do your own thing. It was still like, you know, that was a big undertaking. I feel like there was a lot to live up to just from a musical, like inventive standpoint. And then on top of that, you have to understand, yeah, I didn't really know what the process was. And so... You know, they would send me like a cue sheet with, uh, you know, things that they needed. And I, they encouraged me to start with just like a theme suite, which is something I'm used to doing for films and sometimes TV as well. So they really were just sort of like focus on the music, just write a piece of music for us and let's talk about it. So that was not that much of a jump. But then when I had to start actually properly writing, you know, like exploration cues, which was probably one of my first, first tracks that I wrote, um, I didn't know because, I mean, I don't know what your experience has been like um, for various games, but I didn't have a lot to look at in the beginning stages. I had some concept art and story synopsis, and that was kind of it. So I was sort of like, I'm just going to write what I feel inspired by looking at these things. Mm -hmm. And you guys let me know. Like, I was always very much like, please communicate to me if something's not working because you're building the game. You're seeing what it's, mm -hmm. you know, that, that relationship is like and sometimes it could just be really wrong and it, you're not sure why so they were great about communicating with me if like oh okay this needs more space it's feeling too mystical or it just like needs to be more grounded um so there was it was kind of little by little with that stuff and then i was just busy writing different tracks with different moods and tempi and when i was starting to write layered tracks they were sort of like it needs more shape so when i i feel like when i because i was just starting i was realizing that i was making everything too loopy like internally loopy so like there's a ticker going for three minutes when it doesn't need to be doing that they're like it can change subdivision it can be like it needs to be a shapely piece of music even if it's going to loop at the end it or at some point in the middle like you need to create 
these gestures and switch emphasis and do all of these things. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, that was my naivete in game music was understanding that I can put as much of that switching and breakdowns and things like that in it as I could if it were just an action cue or something like that. What do you think led you to the conclusion that, sorry, I'm just, I'm curious to, to unpack that a little bit. When, what led you to the conclusion that uh, it ought to be somewhat more kind of flat or compact. Like, what do you think made that seem like the logical choice out of out of curiosity? I don't know exactly what it was because the game music that I know and love isn't like that. I think I was just sort of unaware exactly of during the impl- implementation on their end where certain things were going to happen and be triggered. So I was like, do I need to keep this level of consistency in the sound throughout? Or like, I wasn't, I just didn't know. So like my first go at a couple of those cues were just too flat and like not, they weren't as musical as they could have been. Even if there were like themes and modulation, it was just like some of the layers, like the percussive layers were just sitting there. And When they said that, when they explained to me like that it can do these things, I was like, oh, okay. I don't know what, there was just something in my head that I had assumed I couldn't do those things. But truly, there were no limitations. I think the the other kind of, you know, rookie mistake I made was in boss fights, I was sort of building towards the end of the queue because that's, I think that's just like an instinct in all of us to want to just like make it really fat towards the end. And they're Mm -hmm. like, that's not going to work because you loop back and then it loses all the steam. So they were, with the boss fights, I learned that they want it to be at like at a 10 intensity level the whole time so that they have the ability on their end to add those, arrange the queue and add those layers of intensity as you get towards beating the boss, which It's kind of the opposite of what you learn in film and TV. Like you want to like create these shapes and build and do all of these other things, which is not as practical at the start and the finish. So giving them all the fodder that they could just, you know, width wise um, and density wise was, was another thing that I had to readjust to. But I feel like when I, once I learned those sort of very, very crucial things that you would think anybody would know about game music, it was pretty smooth. I think from there on out, um, it was more so just, uh, you know, me asking them a lot of technical questions about like, what would you like things to be labeled as? What would you like the file names to look like? <laughs> well, and everybody's different in that, in that regard. And it never fails to amaze me yeah. how sometimes really huge and complex games have a very ad hoc or like there isn't Ubisoft tends to be pretty sort of type a about that stuff, but some companies are just, it's just chaos where files are called like green squishy thing or whatever and you're like oh, 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 i'm pretty sure i know what that means but it's <laughs> funny because i would actually argue when you say it's you know the instinct as a film and tv composer is let's build to the big finish and in reality what we're doing is staying at 10 i would actually push back and say they're both building to the big finish the key is that one is left to the player as to when that happens which means that sure. you have to you have to have a toolkit that empowers them to build to the finish uh, exactly. But it, 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 it's supposed to be like the lens I always look at this through is if you're watching someone play it, it should feel like a film score to you. Uh, exactly. the, 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 the player in control might be very aware of, oh, I just triggered this thing and that was really satisfying and felt really awesome as a player. And that's one of the things that's more awesome about playing games than watching them disconnect from Gen Z Twitch stream, Austin <laughs> says. Uh, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, to to the audience, it, it will nonetheless read like, "Wow, that that was so like beautifully sculpted and linear. It's like the yeah. it's like the music somehow knew how long the fight was going to last." And that that's to me the the white whale that is always being is chased because it actually is the same. That's one of those things that actually I have been beating the the drum for the duration of my career. That that um, uh, film and TV, the 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 best of the best film and TV composers, and you could you could include opera composers or theater composers in this have a real sense of drama over time and that Mm -hmm. game composers would do well to learn from that but find a way to make it so that they're kind of like tricking the player into creating that arc Uh, that is fundamentally the the goal i would posit humbly as but one person chipping away at this block collectively but um uh, so yeah, that's where it's like, I think that your instincts are actually completely accurate. They were simply showing you how it's achieved within their system, but it, exactly. you were actually doing the right thing. 
Yeah, it's it's all it's just sort of like as composers for film where the last the, the, the buck stops with us, whereas in interactive media, it needs to be adapted. It's it needs to communicate with the player's actions. And we as composers are not responsible specifically for how those things, how long it is before those things happen. And that's why it's that this this field is so highly collaborative with the audio directors and and the supervisors and everything like that because they're they're arranging they're doing all they're making those shapes with your music even if you have the foresight to know like oh this is what it's going to be like at its biggest and its fattest and like i can see how the building blocks are going to go along the way if this is arranged in like a, into a 15 minute 20 minute piece or whatever um, but they fully like have the capability of like shaping that narrative for the player with your stuff. So it's just like a different sort of it, there's a trust there with that, too. Um, but but yeah, that's exactly right. It's like they are making that that sort of shape for the player. Did you find that the quasi surrendering of control that is implicit in that was sort of a queasy feeling like you're because you are right they are effectively arrangers on a on a certain yeah. level was that did that take adjusting to i have a hard time relinquishing control in general um however i was so <laughs> new to games <laughs> i was so new to games and all of it was um I, I just had a lot of trust in in them because they're Ubisoft and they're amazing, the music departments. And I was sort of just like, you you obviously know what to do with this stuff. Um, I don't really, I haven't played Dawn of Ragnarok. So, and Siege of Paris, I've seen a little bit of, of it, but I don't actually know how, how the implementation went. And that's something that I am just disconnected from. So yeah. the fact that I am so intense control-wise with pretty much everything in my life apart, but I just like departed from that and just like let it happen. I think it's mainly because it's going to be a learning experience for me. Like I'm going to see how it was done and maybe that'll affect, you know, how we collaborate moving forward. And I can ask more questions specifically about, you know, how it's going to be done in the final or whatever. They would send me some gameplay that w with it implemented and I kind of got a, a feel for some things, but as some, some scenes, some sequences, I have no idea. So I really should play it and see, and then that should influence how we move forward next but truly so green that i was just like yes enjoy do whatever let me know if you need anything <laughs> does that feel fundamentally different to you for i mean arguably it is but i'm just curious your subjective take on it uh the does it feel different from the way a film dub you really are also relinquishing control and most dubs you have to deliver pretty stemmed out and they may make just as substantive changes there hypothetically the goal is not to like it's yes. really about problem solving than it is creative exploration but some directors just go wild with it uh at the 11th hour and it, if you if you listen to the the sort of james newton howards and and uh hanses of the world who have seen it all and done it all and 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 are continually kind of up at bat they all just seem to have in common this attitude of it's once it's out of my hands, yeah. You, you know, it really is theirs now. Uh, how do you reconcile that with being such a sort of self-described control freak? Um, I am. I try to be on the dub stage whenever I can, if they will let me. And I have certainly been on a dub stage, especially with the TV, like one of my first TV shows, where I just would not shut up. I was like having a hard time. They were mixing the music so low that it was barely there. And I'm like, what's going on? So I would make sure I was at every playback and like giving notes for everything because I did have a hard time like understanding this is where it ends. And I have, I've worked so hard to get to this point for someone to just like not being paying, paying attention when they're riding a fader or whatever. And this is not like mixers are so excellent and amazing at what they do. Obviously it's a craft, but it's sometimes too late. we've already logged project, your <laughs> shit. You can't walk it back. <laughs> You just hate them. You hate mixers as a demographic oh, of society. Yes, yes, globally. I, I do. Um, but, you know, to, to a certain extent, like, yes, you are you are relinquishing. Um, but so I, how did this feel it, different than that? Like, if you've had to learn that, then, if not, you've had to learn... It, okay. It's not. It's the, it's, the, it's the same. I mean, I do feel like in film and TV, I try to 
you know, I, I, I just try to be there for playbacks, like final, final dub playbacks. And at least then I'm like, okay, I know what to expect. I'm not going to go in the theater three months from now and be like, what the hell happened? Like, I'd rather know ahead of time and understand why. And oftentimes that could be a note from a producer being like, we don't like this or like, you know, and I think us composers, we tend to do crafty things. Like when we deliver mixed stems we're like well i want to tie that you know like let, let's put those two stems together because i don't want them to fuck with the balance of it or something like that like i don't want them to be able to get at something um and we do silly things like that but i do think yes, that do. being being present and that that's my level of okay this is at least i'm aware so i'm not blindsided in the end but i think in you know, it is it is the same thing. If you're not going to all the dubs and all the playbacks and all that, you are just being like, this is it. I've done it. This is the product. I, it's in your hands. And that's all. And you it's it's all trust. And there's so much trust that goes into this career in general, whether it's trust with an assistant, trust with, um, you, you know, an editor or with the final dub mixer or the audio director. So I, I think it's all about being being a good partner in all of that and trusting the experience of someone else. And if you want to be there, be there. But having that mutual respect as well for other professionals in the industry, I think is really crucial. And I had the utmost respect for Ubisoft and trust, obviously, in how they're going to implement my music. And at the end of the day, the soundtrack is the big thing for the composer presentation, right? Because that's a very different experience, listening experience than it is. it's going to be in the game anyway. So that's where I put all of my control is into what the soundtrack is going to be too. We'll get to that in a minute because that's definitely something I'm curious to uh, hear how you sort it out. Um, but w did you going into this assume there would be an equivalent of a dub that you would be able to participate in? Like, did you ask at some point about those kinds of steps and they basically were like, yeah, just go ahead and send us the all the raw guts. Like after we've iterated on it and everything signed off, send us as stemmed as deeply as as you can, I would imagine. And, um, and we'll take it from there. Or did you like, did you find yourself going, I'd really like to see like everything you're describing about, oh, I want to be at the dub. I want to be at the dub. Did you have a similar moment and then, they presumably politely held you at bay or did you just assume because you're kind of, you know, you describe yourself as very deer in headlights. I'm sure it wasn't actually like that, but you, you, well, you get what I'm asking. Yeah. I did not ask them that. I was sort of asking them a lot of questions about like, how can I, how can I stem this? How can I prepare this for you so that it gives you the most fodder for, um, the most creative implementation, the most flexibility. That was my crucial thing. And I am very, very organized um, with with all of that stuff. So, and they didn't like give me a layout. They're like, I just, I pitched to them what I wanted to give them. And they're like, yeah, that's great. And I was like, are you sure? Like, don't you, do you need, need anything in addition or what? Um, but no, it was very much like, I just stemmed it out and made it sound as great as I could sent it to them. And I, I said, if there's anything that's just not working or that can be improved, let me know. And they never came back. So I, I, I think also just foolishly, I didn't know if there was such a thing as, you know, I probably could have requested from them, you know, can you get me a, a game capture of this boss fight with like some, you know, just so I can hear how the music is being implemented. They shared a couple of those with me, as I mentioned, but I never was like, I want to see every sequence. I want to like sit down with you guys and control that. Um, because I I didn't I don't know if it's like a not wanting to make waves thing or just a trust thing where I was I said you know I think I hope you're happy with the job that was done and if there's anything more that I can do and it's kind of over to you on your end that's sort of the feel that I got for it. Well, this is where working with a team like the Ubisoft music department as one's first game would definitely understandably have your default position be they know what they're doing yeah you know my goal is to do because i've worked with both types of teams i've worked with teams where it's clear that i knew way more about this than they did and if i didn't intervene god only knows what would come out of it and it's sure. not because they're idiots it's because i just have so much more experience um yeah. you know i've worked with i've worked with startups i've worked with teams that you know really need that helping hand and then obviously yeah there's Folks like you know Simone and the various music supervisors and whatnot who um, they've they've forgotten more about this stuff than most people will ever learn. You know, like it's it's yeah. just really 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 and 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 they're 
they've got this kind of machine going that's really well tuned for delivering these things. And because just the sheer scope of production, you know, people, it's funny how gamers casually out in the world are like, oh my God, you know, another AC. It's like, like a hundred million collective labor hours of work coordinated across thousands of people, like the feat to make that a thing that doesn't come once per century is I know. astonishing. And I just love that there's wow. like, they've gotten the machine so well oiled that they can do these games like one every one to what, two and a half years, give or take. Yeah. And the idea that that's like, you know, it's like reached a point of almost stimulus overload with certain people. You always see those folks complaining. I, it's always hilarious because I go, you know, those folks complain and then the games still sell a gazillion copies. So it's like- Exactly. It's they're, they're still going to play it. They just love still- to bitch. They want to bitch and moan. Where's Mirage gameplay? It's like, okay, well, th- there's other things now too. I mean, you're going to get it, but like everybody relax, please. It is very, it is very funny how we, we managed to let 0.01% of loud people somehow create this impression of being representative of even 5%, never mind more than 50, uh, but such as the, the, the odd re-education we have to all go through on like, you know, just social dynamics in a world where everyone can talk to anyone. But, Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, setting all that aside, something that we kind of glossed over that I realized uh, c- could be really fascinating, especially because I hope that younger composers for whom your story is inspirational, which they'd be stupid to not regard it that way, could really learn from is the demo process. Uh, because Ubisoft ha- does these things kind of a vari- variety of different ways. And, and I actually have no idea what your process was like, you know, how they, what the steps were, you know, it, like sometimes it's very iterative. Sometimes it's, more talking than music, all that kind of just every company works differently. And even Ubisoft's different teams like Toronto, Montreal, Quebec, they all kind of have their different flavors. So what was that like for you? How long of a period was it? I just purely for the educational value to anyone down the road, I'd love to hear what it was like. Yeah, so I've done a couple demos for Ubisoft, um, both of them being like, I, I also did a I think I also, no, maybe it was just for Siege of Paris, actually. I've done a couple for them, haven't gotten the gig for at least one of them. But the demo process that I have been through with Ubisoft specifically, generally they'll um, just send over like a lookbook or presentation specifically for music, which is very involved and detailed, which contains a lot of concept art. And it's it's really inspiring to go off of. Like they give you a lot of information especially if it's, um, you know, a bigger game that has that has a lot of history and legacy to it. They they give you a lot to go off of. And oftentimes they'll hop on you'll hop on a call with some of the creatives, too, and just chat through that, which is a very generous thing to do when you're not even hired as a composer. You know, they want to set you up for success, really. And they know how they know how crucial music is to the storytelling. So I think that sort of ripples through and echoes in in how they handle the demo process with composers. I think it's um, also so worth just interjecting. Those... Sorry, hold that thought just for yeah, five no, seconds. Yeah. I think it's worth interjecting that um, generally speaking, the I don't actually think it's necessarily generosity on their part to have those calls because they will, the people they're inviting to demo is already a whittled pool. It's just worth pointing that out that it's yeah. not like you knocked on their door as a random person off the street and said, hey, I'd love to throw my hat in the ring. Like you sure. you will have already come on their radar. They would have presumably listened to a reel or something. And they've got it down to, I would imagine never more than six people, probably less yeah. than that, where they're, they're truly seriously considering. So now it is like about investing in that process. It's just, again, for anybody who, who later listens to this, who might not be familiar with that, they they will often give you a lot of that time be, because you're you're very serious. This is not a long shot. Like you're, you know, your odds are, you know, one out of three yeah. or whatever. Like, and it's, it's, it's not a cattle call. They never, at least on a Ubisoft and most major publishers, they don't really do those. Sure. Just shoot us whatever, and a thousand people submit stuff. And I just wanted to interject that for the yeah. record, as it were. But go ahead, continue. So you, they, sure. they stepped you through everything. Yeah, they walk you through stuff. Um, you get all those great materials to look at. And I think for any of the demos I've done, for them at least, it was I had probably a week to, to write a demo anywhere between two and a half to five minutes or something like that. 
and they don't really mind. Like they sometimes they're specific about, okay, we'd like to have an A section that's a little bit more ambient and introduces a theme. And then the B section just like build towards a more action oriented or stealth oriented thing. Um, sometimes they don't really mind what you do. They just said, be inspired by it and fit it within this length and then deliver it back to us. So that has been my experience in the demo process. Um, pretty, pretty good. I mean, I, I've definitely had to do demos for television and films where they're like, can we have it tomorrow? And I'm like, mm, go fuck yourself, but uh, fuck yourself. we'll do it, and then, yes. <laughs> but we'll do it. <laughs> and yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I, th I do feel like, I do feel like there's a really wonderful respect for composers in the game world. I don't know if you, I, I've never been like disrespected in film and TV, but it feels like there's this built in sort of, I don't know, they, you're such a big part of the team and I have felt that respect even in the demo process. And that is unique to my experience, but I have felt that way about Ubisoft certainly. So yeah, that that has been what the demos have looked like. And luckily on Siege of Paris, they they hired me after the demo and then hired me for Dawn of Ragnarok after that. Yeah, happily, I don't think that is especially novel. I think that we are, we are made to feel a little lower on the food chain in film and TV. And I don't even think it's done out of disrespect like like they look down on us it's just we're just not as important as other things they have to deal with and when yeah. you're ninth in line and you only have time for seven things like it just happens and it's it's not malice in other words but in games you're right it does seem that music is also it's almost like the default position of game developers and mass with rare reasonably rare exceptions is a kind of spielberg style direction of i'm just banking on music being necessary for the like i don't know what i don't know what the scene will how it's going to play yet but like in the case of spielberg he's like we're just going to have no dialogue and it's be pure visuals and music is going to carry the day and i'm just assuming john williams is going to come up with the right thing and yeah. most directors are kind of too afraid to trust this giant unknown that's going to come at the very end for their film to yeah. work and yeah. but games for whatever reason maybe because we have the opportunity to be in there earlier than the last totally. second yeah exactly it, but it does seem like there's a certain yeah no music is going to be the difference of this working or not and like of course we're going to make it that way like just it's all it's almost like it would be bizarre for them to to think oh yes. let's make sure the game works beautifully with no score then we'll add score like game designers don't think that way but that's routinely common for film and TV. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, we're part of the world building in a big, big way musically. And that's why they like to hire composers at like the genesis of that story. Even they've been working on it for a while, but like, you know, I was hired very early on, on the games that I have worked on. Um, and film and TV is usually like, oh, we've been in the edit for a couple months. We should probably think about music now, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, like it makes sense. Sometimes it can be a bit of an afterthought, certainly not with everyone, but you know, I think, I think starting early on with early concept conversations has a lot to do with the respect that they have for composers and their contribution. How long were, were those two um, DLCs? Um, like how long was I working on them? Yeah, like I, I realized I had no concept for that because obviously DLCs are, are kind of a microcosm of the, of the thing for which they are DLCs overall production, yeah. but some of them are so gigantic that they're borderline sequels, uh, you know, that's, that's yeah. one of those odd phenomenon with certain games. And so um, my assumption was that the time would have been considerably shorter, but actually maybe, yeah. maybe not. Yeah. So Siege of Paris was, was like a, a pretty short, short game. Um, I can't remember the amount of gameplay hours it was, but I wrote about 40 minutes of score for Siege of Paris and I worked on it maybe for about three months. And then yeah, Dawn so of Ragnarok terms, was pretty short. Yeah, yeah. Dawn of Ragnarok was much longer. It's like the biggest expansion Assassin's Creed has ever done. Significantly more gameplay. And that was a little over an hour of music over the course of... By the time I started writing, I would say like four to five months, maybe. Yeah, that feels about right. Um, yeah. Um, Which is so, like a good amount of time. It's like the perfect amount of, you know, time to get that stuff done. So I was oh, happy well, to and, I it. mean, and... and like you said, it's so luxurious compared to film and TV where, you know, especially if you're doing like network style TV, where an hour of music is that's by Friday, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, it's totally. not, not even next week or next month, never yeah, mind six exactly. months from now or whatever, four months or so it always yeah. feels, and it's always funny how 
when people work like I, when I, at least when I've been hired by folks who their only knowledge of the composer's world is through games and they'll call and they'll go, mm -hmm. we have about a year. I just want to make sure that's going to be okay. Like, and I'm sitting there going the number of times that I've had to pull stuff out in like days, just literally like 45 yeah. minutes of music over a three day period or time. It's always, I've definitely gotten complacent or sometimes I'm like, I mean, yeah, it is pretty short because I've <laughs> sort of like kind of gotten gotten a little a little used to how nice that can be, but but it is actually yeah. really possible to do it in way less time, and 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 uh, so it just puts us in a position of being the one who reassures them. Yeah, yeah, believe me, it's all good. We'll make it work. It's all good. Yeah, I want to ask you what your experience has been like working on longer form games where you could be on it for a couple years. How how do you plan? for that like work within that time if sometimes they'll be like yeah we have this amount of music we need by this time and then they go away for a few months like how do you balance other projects in there when it is such a like long-term thing well usually things are organized into milestone schedules so that even if even if you're like i know i'm not gonna be done for three years i do have a sense of what needs to be done by next month because there's usually okay. if they don't offer that i will usually propose something like sure. that so that otherwise it's you too like it's yeah there, it, it becomes it, this abstract hypothetical yeah. yeah you're like i i'm working on a game i don't know what i'm doing i i don't know like it become you lose yeah. contact with reality i like to ground things and 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 find yeah. sort of you know what is the actual real manifestation of this pie in the sky thing we're dreaming about mm -hmm. um and then just taking off you know small bites knowing that you don't have to plan the whole thing you don't have to go okay every day, every week between now and like a line producer you know going through and saying every single hour between now and three years from now is accounted for and that way yeah. i know immediately if i'm behind schedule is to you typically don't have to get that granular because again just like with the TV comparison, if we start to drift behind schedule and it's like, oh, we were hoping to have 20 extra minutes in by the end of this year and there's only 10 minutes, like it's usually if you're if you're keeping track of that stuff, you're it's usually well plenty of time to yeah to take the heat up and get things sort of on track or or, or whatever. Sure. And I also I also really like having regular meetings, just like I constantly, you know, every every week or every two weeks even if there's nothing necessarily to show new, just to make sure that you're very aware of what's of what's happening because it happens all the time that, like I'll go to the all hands meetings with teams. Like I really like going to these big standups where there's like 80 people on a call or whatever. Uh, and they're like, everyone goes through what they did that week. And sometimes hmm. they'll be like, oh man, the animation department just did the fucking coolest thing. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go make something for that to show them next yeah. week. Like no one asked for it. I just saw it sure. and was like, it's going to need music, undoubtedly. Let's go do it. Um, you know, of course, some games certainly worked on projects like your experience, uh, as you described it, where they they kind of, they've sort of done a lot of that. And, and this is where DLCs also often will kind of extract their formula from the thing that they're stemming off of. So they'll know, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, if it's, if it's uh, an hour of music, 30 minutes of that is going to be kind of open world exploration that needs to go one way or the other. You know, yeah. We'll carve out for some side missions, a uh, little we'll carve out for some cinematics, you know, the bulk of what's remaining will be combat. And then a couple little like Uber boss fight combat variants. Like it's like they fit into these buckets that are pretty well understood and you might adjust sure. a little bit from here, a little bit from there, but they've got it pretty dialed in. But when it, when you're starting on something from scratch and it's like, new IP, new, especially if the mechanics are really unusual and it's like, no one's ever really quite done this before. In my experience, at least the first third is just throwing shit against the wall and yeah, going, oh, that, yeah. didn't, that didn't work. Let's just throw that away. Yeah. And I did this game, The Pathless, where a year and a half into it, I threw out 100% of everything I'd written. Uh, and I just decided wow. this doesn't work because I've thought of something better. And the game has achieved, like they've designed so much since I began that is yeah. different from how it started. We all have clarity. We finally know what the game is. You know, the exactly. nice thing about working on an Assassin's Creed game or a Far Cry or a Call of Duty or whatever is you don't like the nice thing and the bummer is you don't have that experience. Like you're kind of, your knowns are known. 
And that can be very relieving, but it's also fun. I enjoy the act of discovery that comes with totally new IP where you're, you go, oh, fuck. We've been doing it wrong. We only know yeah. that because we handed it to some stranger. They played the game and we realized, oh, my God, we haven't been making the game we thought we'd been making. And, sure. you know, that's that's just the nature of, of those kinds of projects, which is, again, equally the excitement and the bummer <laughs> of those as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on Dawn of Ragnarok, we had that on a very micro level where the first few minutes of score that I wrote, they were starting to put it up to um, the game, some of the exploration bits. And they're like, we're realizing that it just needs to be more spacious and it needs to just like breathe more. And they didn't know that that was going to be the case until they really got to that moment. And they showed me like some gameplay and I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, that's totally right. This is not this is not the feel for it. It needs to have this like greatness to it. Um, so so, yeah, I can see that very much happening. I feel like I get that way on regardless of what project I work on, like the earlier stuff that I'm tapping into first, even if it might be gut instincts, like you got to live with it for a little bit. And then you I always circle back and I'm like, I hate this so much. I'm rewriting it because like you get to the to the meat of it and you realize, OK, this is it. This is it. Not the stuff I wrote first. Did you did anything from your demo survive either musically or you know like in in principle like conceptually even if you rewrote it it sort of derived from that like did did it actually get through the 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 process or by the time it shipped was it basically you had found better ideas and it was you'd evolved away from it Uh yeah none none of it none of it ended up in there it was a totally Totally different thing. I think mainly because I went too like fantastical and mystical with it at first, and that was not like a little too Lord of the Ringsy in some ways. And they wanted something a little bit more grounded and unique and just like different for it, um, which they also didn't quite realize yet either. That was before we had the black metal conversation. But um, yeah, mm. no, none of that survived. I don't think anything from oh maybe it, my demo from Siege of Paris, the theme made it. I think the theme survived from that. And I used Siege of Paris, I used Viola da Gamba, which ended up being like a big part of the sound of the game and the sound of Paris, even if it was much later musical history wise than, than when the How Siege of Paris you. actually happened. I know I'm just so rule breaking. God, There's historians um, that are looking at this going, the fuck kind of historical accuracy is this score in our, in our, in our game where, you know, earth was, seated by aliens and and uh um you can access your memory you can have this like carl jungian access of memories because of a magic table uh yeah yeah How dare never you? work in this town again never work again uh yeah but but the yeah dawn of ragnarok was there was there were some failures actually my first stab at the theme suite after i got hired was also i think I just, nothing survived from that it just wasn't right um, which is consistent for me through all of my work is that my first stab at everything fucking sucks. So at least <laughs> I know that now and I know, okay, it's just hard to get motivated to suck for a little bit and then get it out of the way and then find something that works. But it's part of my process, as they would say. Well, and I think it speaks to your collaborators at Ubisoft that they- They didn't fire me, that I agree. Space. Yeah, they, exactly. They gave <laughs> the space for experimentation or you could even say the space yeah. to fail- it's to me. It's actually very cool that the demo uh, is sort of largely in the past, and the final score was free to move away from that because yeah. it really shows the difference between what it took to get the job versus what it is to do the job, and they can be yes, you know, pretty damn. Dif like distinct from each other sometimes, and sometimes not. I mean, there's occasionally. I mean, I, Sam Hulick, I, I found out not that long. When I did this recording, actually, with, with Jack Wall, and we were talking about Mass Effect, he was saying that Sam was invited to, to demo and wrote a piece that, like, if you go on Spotify, it is far and away the most popular thing that certainly he did, if not anybody did, for the Mass Effect games. It's, it's just the music that plays over the map they call Distant Worlds. And it was his demo. It was verbatim his demo. And I was like... That blew my mind when I discovered that because I just, that's never, at least I'm with you. I always try to very quickly discover what makes it shit and figure out how to scrub that yes. out. And I'm just, and just thrilled yeah. I got the job. Uh, yeah. And but occasionally lightning seems to strike even when you're just speculating on what it could be and you haven't even seen anything yet. Yeah, yeah. And I think... I think it's true. Like there, Ubisoft was, there was obviously something in the demo where they said, yes, this could work, even if this isn't 
you know, right in the pocket right away. How could it be just with a demo? Some people, but like you said, some people, yeah, that's fascinating. But they heard something. And then I think that also goes back to the trust thing where they said, we think this could be a good collaboration. And we know that you have these inflections that we think could be really great. Um, and even if what we ended up with was a huge departure from that, they they took a chance on it. And taking a chance, especially on a composer who has no game experience, that's no small thing. And I'm grateful that there are game companies out there like that and studios likewise, you know, that are doing that because that's the only way that we we get newer voices in, we get diverse voices in and all that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful that they did that. And I'm grateful that they did allow for that experimentation, especially with the black metal and stuff. I mean, it even took a little bit to get to the right black metal balance that felt right for the game, too. So it's all being dialed in. And that's that's the case for for most games. But especially when you're doing something stylistically, that might be a departure from something else. I think that's usually the case. Hundred percent. Well, I I, I want to also just ask real quick um, about the soundtrack album process because the nature of the kind of toolkit of future interactive music that is often delivered, there's a certain sense of oh, I just wrote a track and it's just like I'm just gonna make a playlist of the music and it's just straight on, and I think at least that's if if Twitter is any gauge. That's what I think a lot of players perceive the game soundtrack to be. It is just literally, here's an accounting of what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And at least in my case, I tend to just to lean into the editorial process to the point that it is almost a new production. I've actually even like snuck proprietary things in there where I'm like, I need to write, I need to connect these things better than they, they they're not meant to flow into each other this way in the, yeah. in the game. But now that I have them side by side on the album, it's not. So I'm going to just like go and I'll write and record like bits just to just to kind of bridge those gaps or, or I'll even yep. like so many times on orchestral sessions, I'll like record a bunch of transitional things that I'm only going to use on the album because I just know yep. I'm going to need them. Um, sure. So how much of that stuff did you do? Did you and also just how does that compare to your because you like uh, something like Jupiter Legacy? you're writing presumably a lot more music than you're going to put out on the album. Yeah. So there's an editorial process from uh, both a filtering and a literal, like connecting this to this, which are not actually adjacent in the show. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. What's your thinking? How do you navigate that? How was it different here relative to those? Blah, 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 blah. Pretend it was an interesting yeah, question. I I w <laughs> it is an interesting question. I, I would say that my process is much like much like yours. Um, I looked at the putting the soundtrack together as an opportunity to make this music into something that can stand on its own, and it, it's a different listening experience potentially than what exists in the game. So you know we have an opportunity there. We have we have pieces of music that we designed to have these multi layers, and it's just like begging for a remix or an arrangement or something like that. So I that's that's what I did. I I kind of went through. I cut the fat. I I had you know maybe five layers. How did you define what was the fat? Like did you like what 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 made that ping that way for you? Uh, just something I didn't really find particularly interesting to listen to. Um, like some, it's like some cutscene stuff that was just like more tension. I don't really care to include. Like I wouldn't want to hear that on a soundtrack necessarily. Well, that's not true. I don't really want to listen to my music ever. But I, I think that just, <laughs> you know, like if it was if it was Alan Silvestri's tension cue, I would probably listen to that. But for me, I wanted it to be like really concise and. Um, for the flow to be right. And I don't like including things that I feel like just don't necessarily have a place. Um, so yeah, I try not to be too precious about my music in that, in that kind of way. Truth be told, I probably could have trimmed off fat off of the Dawn of Ragnarok soundtrack, but I'm, I was happy with how it, how it all came together and the performances that were on there. I really wanted to be part of it. So mm. yeah, I, I went through and, you know, I would take, I would take these layers and maybe I would like start out with the fight layers on top and then like break it down in all of these different ways. And then maybe connect it to other music that kind of ended up just like working together as a performance. I would say the only thing on the soundtrack that existed in its full form is the first track, the main theme, because that was written just to play out on its own. Like it didn't right. have to, you know, that was just a, it actually a full was piece a of track. music. 
Yes, exactly. But everything else is is an arrangement or a compilation or it has sweeteners or it has like all of these other things to make it what I hope is is a fun listening experience on an album. It, 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 like was that because I, I I'm curious. Conversations like this make me feel like I'm just really not a very smart person because I came to the conclusion of everything that you're describing because I would like my first time ever doing a game. I I just basically put all the music in a playlist and thought, oh, maybe this will be the album. And I hated it. I was like, this is so boring. And it didn't even occur to me that it would be boring until I literally forced myself to listen to it and then th realized like, okay, there should probably be an editorial process here. But it sounds like you sort of, you intuited that ahead of time, which impresses me. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I will... I, I did that for Harry for six years. I compiled all of his all of his soundtracks. Mm. So I think I had the experience there. And he also is very not precious about his music. So he'd be like, why is there just 10 seconds of the strings holding here? Like, let's get to something else. Let's get a move on. And <laughs> I think like, even though he could have like let it simmer a little bit sometimes, I think I, I did take away a lot of important lessons from that, which is how do we make the music better? Just because it was written this way doesn't mean it's the best representation of what it could be. So especially coming into the to the game stuff. I mean, I definitely am try to be discerning about my other soundtracks for TV and and film stuff as well, like Jupiter's Legacy, yeah, hours and hours of music and it's the soundtrack is about an hour. Um and I may, had to make a lot of decisions and I make a lot of people listen to the soundtracks too before I let it go. Mm. Um and like I think we all have those couple people in our life who gives us gi gives it to us straight and you really trust their opinion. So I send it to them and they're just like, yeah, we just really, you just don't need this track. And I'm like, thank you. Okay, great. Like I wasn't, I thought it was going to be a really good, you know, addition, but to, to hear it from somebody else, I think it's important to get that outside perspective as well. But especially in the game, when I, when I came into game music, I was like, this is, this could be fun. This could be a really fun way to arrange the music in a, in a different way. And, and it was, it was, it was a long, it was like, it took me a week to put the soundtrack together and I put it together in my mother-in-law's guest bedroom over Christmas. Um, and <laughs> that was, that was just, everybody was just there like, what the hell is she doing up there? But it was, yeah, I think it's fun. I think it's, I'm a, working it's on a, that cool Grammy is what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I really should have uh, thanked her in my in my speech. That was a mistake. Well, that's okay. You, they they make very clear you have mere seconds. Um, so that that uh, that's actually kind of a wonderful uh, sort of last little thing to dwell on, and then I will uh, let you go to your afternoon. Um, the sort of two in one, something that I you already have felt uh, that we talked about the other day is that there is a there is a baseline awareness of what we do amongst c gamers even the most casual of gamers compared to whatever their counterpart is in film like somebody who watches one random Netflix show a year is exponentially less likely to be aware of who wrote the music and what they're like and things of that nature, or even just the idea that that's a job that people write music, yeah. you know, uh, that it's just, it's, it's very, very rare for film scores. If you're not John Williams, if you're not, you know, it's not, I would, I, it's not even Howard Shore. If you're not the Lord of the Rings um, yeah. or Hans, like people just don't pay attention to it, but games, it exercises a far larger place in their consciousness. And there's a lot of reasons why I think we both sort of understand. I, I'm really curious, what has that experience been like for you? Because I'm just assuming, and if there's any righteousness in the universe, uh, it, it is the case, that you've been the recipient of far more attention from just the average player than you're probably accustomed to from like the viewers of Jupiter's Legacy or the Step Up stuff or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Like what just, just how's that been? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, before I even started writing my first game score, I, I, that was compounding my anxiety because I know I'm a gamer <laughs> and I love to listen to that music and I know that gamers really listen. So it's, it's, there, there's an extra pressure there because it, it's, you want to connect with them all the more and you want to give them something that's going to 
like tie to the memory of playing that game. And that's what we have the power to do as composers. We have like, you know, when I hear the theme to Halo, I just get this like guttural thrill of like excitement and just all of these things that I don't, I mean, I feel a lot of strong feelings about certain films and things and stories, but not that way that I feel about games. And we have a responsibility there to like, to create something great for them that they can just like tie in this very visceral way to the story. So daunting and thrilling for sure. Writing, <laughs> writing for it. It was, it was, but like, yeah, the like reading, I shouldn't go into the cesspool of YouTube comments, but I do. And <laughs> there <laughs> we are all like, do. we all do it. And it's, it's, it's generally just very amazing to be able to connect with people all, all over the world in this way that they just like they want to keep listening it's not just oh yeah this cool soundtrack came out i'm going to check it out whatever on spotify once they want to keep coming back because it's tied to a memory and so i i love that's what i love most about gaming is being able about writing game music rather is is being able to develop that with people i'll never know in a meaningful way. So I I love that we can awesome. set that set that mood for them, that we can build that world for them and that they can revisit these these memories through the music. Has that has the experience of the Grammys um noticeably kind of amplified that you know, is it is it I'm sure you know all your Friends and families and acquaintances you haven't heard from everybody you know invariably reached out and were were thrilled. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the 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 players and the kind of the the people you don't know, did you find a surge of well wishing? Yeah, again, I, I certainly I hope so. But I, I'm just I curious did. how yeah. <laughs> uh, aware people are. You know. Sometimes these things yeah. feel like the biggest deal in the world to us. And then we realize how inside baseball it is. And so you, yes. it's, that's why I'm curious, you know, if, cause the AC community tends to be pretty active. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking in a very leading, I hope <laughs> I know what your answer will be, but I am genuinely curious. Yeah. I mean, I think everything I do is very inside baseball, but when it came to Assassin's Creed and all the, you know, social media stuff that they were posting, everybody was really lovely and um, said that they, they really did enjoy the soundtrack, even if they didn't play the game and they're just asking for Mirage gameplay. Like a lot of them listened to the album and uh, they, they, they loved, they said they connected with it and they enjoyed it and they said it was well-deserved. And that, that does go a long way because you always want to be able to to impact people with your music. Ultimately, I think that's why we all write music is because we want to connect with others. So yes, it was very lovely. It was lovely to hear from some of the fans. Um, and yeah, Good. that'll probably be my last Grammy. So first and last, and now I retire. That's it. That's what's happening. <laughs> I suspect not. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, fate is unknown. Uh, but I, I, uh, I really do suspect not. I it is one of those where every now and again someone will get lucky and be the right person at the right time or or whatnot. But everything about their demeanor or their work, sometimes someone is just the right person for the job, but it's clear that that's that one thing was kind of the one thing they can do. So they they milk everything they can out of it and well they should because there may not be many more opportunities. And then there's other folks, yourself very much included, at least from my assessment, uh, that that's it couldn't be more the opposite. It's it's this is just one example of many, and there's a lot of places. And the most exciting thing is it's a lot of unknown places. Who knows where what will come next? I mean, you yourself have spoken to that. You know, this particular blend of that kind of like Scandinavian black metal with this very sort of almost ethereal textural electronic stuff with these other kind of guttural and visceral instrumental things. That's not exactly like a subgenre you spend all your time in and, oh my God, how great a game came along that let me do this thing I do otherwise all day long. <laughs> like you, you are an explorer. I think that's one of the things that we all share in common typically in this line of work because every day is different. So I would not be surprised if you're just routinely uh, kind of in those pools um, for the film and the TV side, uh, it's been very gratifying to see good things happen to good people. Uh, so from, from my standpoint, I'm, 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 I just love it. And I'm very happy to have 
made it an excuse to to get you on here and and share you know your your insights and i really it's just invaluable i think to to get while the iron's hot and while you're you're not going oh yeah what what did we do there because it was like 20 years ago like as i love asking i've had jesper and a lot of other folks mm-hmm. who've been doing games a long time when i ask about those early game experiences it is often you know Hmm. <laughs> and so I, I love, <laughs> yeah, I really, I really love the opportunity to, to kind of, um, to hear it fresh, knowing that, yeah, you, you, you know, you deliver it at the highest conceivable level. You know, it, there's nothing, there's nothing green or first game esque about your work. It's like this odd trivia that it would be, uh, or that it was. Uh, and so anyway, I think it's awesome. Uh, that's that's all I've got. You've told me all the things. Uh, all the things. I very Thank much you. appreciate your indulgence of all my curiosities. I actually, when we hung out the other day, I very deliberately avoided asking you all the things I wanted to ask you <laughs> because I knew we were going to be doing this so shortly thereafter. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for enduring my interrogation. Um, and uh, it's it's exciting to see what comes next. Thank you. Thank you for all those kind words. Truly, it means so much coming from you. I have such deep admiration of you. So just hearing you say that is makes me want to light myself this on out fire. Of the episode. But, um, no, you know. this. <laughs> but thank you, truly. And thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, God, let's just do this every week, I guess. I mean, yeah, it feels, no shit. It feels, it feels right, yeah.